Good morning. Our session today is uh, kind of explores what it's like to teach at two very different universities. Gerald Mast is a professor of communication at Bluffton University, a Mennonite college that focuses on peace teaching of the church. Gerald's published many books and articles, including Teaching Peace, Nonviolence of, and the Liberal Arts, Defenseless Christianity, and a Baptism in a Nonviolent World, or Nonviolent Church, not Nonviolent wor World, <laughs> and his latest Go to Church, Change the World, Christian Community as a Calling. Christopher Eboli teaches at the Naval Academy, which I can only imagine has a slightly different vibe than Bluffton University. <laughs> Christopher is an associate professor of philosophy and specializes in religion and politics. He's also published a number of articles on the ethics of war, including religious conviction in the profession of arms, just cause, and cyber war. And he's just completing a manuscript entitled God and War, Some Exploratory Questions. This morning promises to be very enlightening as we hear from two professors from two very different colleges. Please join me in welcoming Gerald Mast and Christopher Eberly. So Gerald's going to go first. Good morning. I begin uh, this morning with 16th century Dutch Anabaptist leader Menno Simons, uh, from whom Mennonites received their name, who in 1552 published one of many works urging his Christian neighbors and the magisterial authorities to practice tolerance towards dissenting communities like his own. In his treatise, Menno responded to the charge that he and his people are Munsterites who would take over the country by force if given the chance. Munsterites were uh, these Anabaptists, apocalyptic Anabaptists, who uh, took over the city in 1534 and um, practiced polygamy and abolished private property and did other scandalous things. Um, Menno wants to be clear that his type of Anabaptists are not like the Munsterites. So he writes in this uh, pamphlet that in the scriptures there are two opposing princes and two opposing kingdoms, one the prince and kingdom of peace, the other the prince and kingdom of strife. He then offers a characterization of the peaceful kingdom of Jesus Christ that has proved inspiring for many generations of readers. Quote, the prince of peace is Jesus Christ. His kingdom is the kingdom of peace, which is his church. His messengers are the messengers of peace. His word is the word of peace. His body is the body of peace. His children are the seed of peace, and his inheritance and reward are the inheritance and reward of peace. In short, with this king and in his kingdom and reign, it is nothing but peace. Everything that is seen, heard, and done is peace." End quote. I think it is safe to say that when Mennonites have built educational institutions, one central goal was to build communities in which everything that is seen, heard, and done is peace. Bluffton University, where I teach, is one of those institutions. Founded by General Conference Mennonites in 1899, Bluffton is deeply rooted in the arts and aspirations of peace, in particular, the kind of peace identified with Jesus Christ and belonging to his kingdom and body of peace, the church. Bluffton's mission statement, for example, begins with the assumption of this defining affiliation with a peace church. And I'm quoting it here, shaped by that peace church tradition, Bluffton University seeks to prepare students of all backgrounds for life as well as vocation, for responsible citizenship, for service to all peoples, and ultimately for the purposes of God's universal kingdom. My remarks this morning reflect on two aspects of this mission statement and its practical implementation on our campus and in our curriculum. First, I will discuss how the Peace Church tradition has shaped the Bluffton campus and institutional ethos. Second, I will provide a brief account of changing meanings of peace in the Mennonite Church and at Bluffton that are shaping our academic curriculum. So first, how Bluffton is shaped by the Peace Church tradition. Like other Mennonite and Peace Church colleges, Bluffton was founded in part to strengthen the peace teaching of the church 
in the lives and experiences of the church's young people, specifically to offer an institutional respite from the pressures of nationalism and militarism found in the broader cultural mainstream. At Bluffton, as at other Mennonite schools, this meant and continues to mean the absence of any military training programs or military recruitment on our campus, and a campus culture that supports conscientious objection to warfare. However, from its very beginning, Bluffton went beyond teaching non-resistance to promoting active peacemaking. This activist posture is illustrated in the life of C. Henry Smith, one of Bluffton's early faculty advocates for a broad approach to teaching and practicing peace. A history professor with roots among the Illinois Amish, Smith wrote numerous Mennonite history books and promoted Mennonite colleges as crucial to the survival of peace convictions in the Mennonite church. Rejecting the more common sectarian approach to peace found among Mennonites in the early 20th century, Smith modeled an unusually public promotion of peace for several generations of Bluffton students. As a public intellectual, he advocated for peace in many venues, from the classroom to the pulpit to the Lions Club. And at a time when Mennonites were most concerned to protect CO status for their young people, Smith made so bold as to offer public criticism of specific wars in public venues and beyond the church, such as in the YMCA. As a bank president of some financial means, he put his money where his mouth was, establishing an endowment that continues to support numerous peace education activities at Bluffton and other Mennonite schools. Among those activities, for example, is the annual intercollegiate C. Henry Smith Peace Oratorical Contest held on most, held on most North American Mennonite College campuses each year, including Bluffton. Also, each year, a faculty member from either Bluffton or Goshen College delivers the C. Henry Smith Peace Lecture at both Bluffton and Goshen, funded by the Smith Endowment. Many other faculty and alumni have followed Smith's lead over the years by contributing gifts and establishing programs on our campus that provide a high profile for peace on a routine basis. Every year, for example, there is the Endowed Keeney Peace Lecture, which brings significant public advocates for peace to our campus for a presentation and discussion. Last year's Keeney Peace Lecture was Dr. Ted Grimsrud, Professor of Theology and Peace Studies at Eastern Mennonite University. His lecture on our campus offered a provocative evaluation of World War II using just war criteria. I mention this because Dr. Grimsrud is present at this conference. An influential and eccentric Bluffton art professor named John Peter Klassen came to Bluffton in 1923 as a refugee from the Russian Revolution, part of the migration of thousands of Mennonites from the Ukraine in the wake of the two world wars. Klassen, who like many Russian Mennonites had served as a conscientious objector with the Red Cross during the World War I, contributed numerous peace sculptures to the public visual space of our campus. And uh, this tradition of peace sculptures is a tradition that's been extended over the years through the contributions of peace art to our campus by numerous artists, including a peace sculpture garden funded by the Honda Corporation that features a peace wall, part of it resembling the Vietnam War Memorial, and including the names of peace advocates from Jesus Christ to Gandhi, who gave their lives for the way of peace. The Peace Sculpture Garden is located just outside the Lion and Lamb Peace Arts Center, which was founded by education faculty member Elizabeth Hostetler in 1987. The center provides many resources for school-aged children who arrive by the busload on our campus to view the center's large collection of peace art, to browse the many peace-related children's books, to listen to stories of peacemakers and peacemaking, and to join in a variety of peace and conflict transformation learning experiences led by the center's director. The work of this Peace Art Center has extended the Claussen collection of sculptures to fill our campus with a public art of peace. The, the Peace Sculpture Garden mentioned earlier includes not only a peace wall, but also a peace house. Just outside my office window is a large, and at least on windy days, a very noisy um, set of chimes called Peace Sounds. Down over the hill, down over the hill from the chimes are the Peace Thrones. And uh, right up the hill from there is the Peace Pole, the International Peace Pole. And at the entrance to our campus is a beautiful Paul Granlin sculpture called Constellation Earth. 
in which dancing figures are mutually intertwined in the shape of a globe. Near the entrance to our student center are the international flagpoles, which feature flags uh, from the nations represented by our international students. You can see I'm bringing a little of a blust blustery winter weather here uh, to California from Bluffton. Within this artfully framed campus environment, there is an almost inexhaustible list of traditions and routines and activities that cultivate the practices and habits of peace. The Campus Peace Club sponsors an annual Justice Week that features presentations by prominent peace leaders and provides opportunities for our students to practice peace and advocate justice. Each year there is a global <coughs> weekend <coughs> sponsored by our International Connection Club that turns our campus into a global food and culture bazaar. All of our students are required to complete a cross-cultural immersion experience either in one of our semester off-campus opportunities or through our May term trips that take students to places like Botswana, Colombia, Bolivia, Trinidad, and China. Almost invariably, Bluffton students report that this cross-cultural experience was the single most important event that happened to them at college. Bluffton strives to practice peacemaking in addressing the challenges of student life and relationships. Students who violate our campus standards of conduct may opt to follow a restorative justice process in which offenders are brought together with those harmed to discuss the harm done and to develop a contract for making resolution or restitution. Related to this process is the honor system we follow during academic examinations in which no proctors are present and students are invited to sign a pledge if they are honestly able that I am unaware of any inappropriate aid having been given and received during this examination. Every year a graduating senior receives the Jim Satterwhite Award in Peace Scholarship and Activism established in honor of a faculty member who made a costly peace witness through war tax resistance and as a reservist with Christian peacemaker teams. Earlier this month, our campus hosted the annual Intercollegiate Peace Fellowship Conference attended by over 200 people and bringing students from several Mennonite and Peace Church colleges together for workshops and seminars devoted to the study and practice of peace. And beyond such events, there is a steady drumbeat of peace-related chapel sermons, stage dramas, musical events, book celebrations, student life activities, and field trips. It is hard to overstate how much we think and talk and act and dream about peace at Bluffton as a matter of routine. Although there is much campus life activity related to peace at Bluffton, we are also committed to the cross-curricular academic study of peace and nonviolence, and this is my second focal point this morning. Our peace curriculum reflects important changes in Mennonite understandings about the biblical meanings of peace, namely that the love and, the love and non resistance taught by Jesus Christ invites not just a rejection of war, but also the restoration of broken relationships and the pursuit of just public policies, even when such policies fall short of the nonviolent perfection of Christ. This more socially active vision of peacemaking has been shaped at Mennonite institutions like Bluffton by the writing and teaching of Mennonite social ethicist John Howard Yoder, who argued that pacifist communities like the Mennonites could have a Christian witness to a coercive state through appeals to middle axioms that provide the best secular and prudential grounds for a more just and peaceful public policy without giving up the higher standard for nonviolent Christian discipleship in the church's life and mission. Middle axioms are also a basis for an ecumenical appeal to Catholics, Lutherans, and Presbyterians to be more reluctant to support war on just war grounds, but without giving up pacifism as the peace church stance. Such a vision for peacemaking as policy advocacy and peace building has led to an increasingly robust body of knowledge in the interrelated disciplines of restorative justice and conflict transformation. Two of the most prominent thinkers and practitioners in these fields are Howard Zare uh, in restorative justice and John Paul Lederach in conflict transformation. Zare and Lederach were both involved in the creation of the Center for Justice and Peace Building at Eastern Mennonite University. Uh, um, this is a graduate program that has been filling the world with trained practitioners of peace building, including the 2011 Nobel Prize winner, uh, Lema Gabawi from Liberia. At Bluffton, uh, we rely on this emerging body of justice uh, and peace building knowledge, which helps us to define the focus and priorities of our programs in criminal justice and social work, for example. 
as my colleagues Rudy Kaufman in Criminal Justice and Heather Kuntz in Social Work have documented in a jointly authored chapter they published recently. In the chapter, they describe how Bluffton students explore the tension between rules-based justice and relationship-based justice through case studies that invite students to clarify their own definition of justice and to make career choices that free them to pursue that definition. Because criminal justice majors take a substantial number of social work classes at Bluffton, the relationship-centered goals that provide the focal point for social work contribute to an expanded and complicated consideration by criminal justice majors of what it means to seek justice and encouraging students to consider both the leverage and corruption associated with coercive power and assisting students to decide whether or not to accept roles that involve carrying a gun or applying potentially lethal force. While restorative justice and conflict transformation are typically practiced with accountability to the disciplines of social science, in Mennonite settings, they have also been rooted in Anabaptist biblical studies and theology, and especially the work of Old Testament scholar Millard Lind at Associated Now Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary in Elkhart, Indiana. Howard Zare's classic book, Changing Lenses, for example, relies on Lind's scholarship to argue that restorative justice is rooted in the biblical understandings of covenant relationships that ground human well-being and wholeness in the broader vision of shalom that God intends for humanity. At Bluffton, our interdisciplinary peace and conflict studies program continues that biblical engagement by combining biblical and theological knowledge with social scientific approaches to conflict transformation and peacemaking. The current director of this peace and conflict studies program at Bluffton is a well-published biblical and historical theologian, Alex Sider who is quite conversant with the theological ethics of John Howard Yoder. He currently teaches our course on war, peace, and nonviolence, which is a core course in the Peace and Conflict Studies program, as well as a course option in our general education program. Sider reports that he teaches this course as a descriptive survey of the broad variety of conflicting ways that the Christian church has responded to violence and war, while also providing a more prescriptive account fe featuring both just war and pacifism frameworks. Although there is perhaps a particularly intense focus on peace-related questions in the programs mentioned thus far, the teaching of peace is by no means ghettoized in our religion and social science departments. Over 10 years ago, a substantial number of our faculty representing all of our academic programs gathered for a meeting uh, at the Comfort Inn uh, at the edge of our small town and spent the better part of, of the day in a wide-ranging discussion of the question, how do we study and teach the way of peace in our classes? Through several prepared presentations and extensive discussion, we realized that we could strengthen the teaching of peace by asking basic epistemological questions in each of our academic disciplines, such as how might the assumption that peace is the will of God enable us to look for peace in places we hadn't previously noticed it? How can we encourage our students to understand peace as not just something we try to practice in a brutal and warring world, but as a gift already given in a created and evolving world? If, as John Howard Yoder argued, people who bear crosses are working with the grain of the universe, how can the liberal arts and sciences help us recognize that cross-shaped grain? As our faculty continued discussion about these questions, many of us were inspired toward more systematic research and writing on the theme of studying and teaching peace. We gathered the results of our research together and published them in an interdisciplinary volume entitled Teaching Peace, Nonviolence, and the Liberal Arts. The book's contents include chapters on biblical studies, theology, history, international conflict, communication, literature, art, theater, music, economics, criminal justice, psychology, biology, mathematics, education, and business. My favorite chapter is authored by my colleague Angela Montel, a biologist who writes about the violent metaphors that subtly shape the direction of research in immunology and cell biology. She proposes a more peaceful metaphorical horizon for the study of struggling microbes and concludes that while she believes in antibiotic and vaccine development, she desires to, quote, train my senses also to see the dance between microbe and host, to feel one with the great circle of life, and to appreciate the sacrificial suffering through to something higher that binds us to all creation and to the nonviolent suffering redeemer himself. It's maybe my favorite sentence in that whole book. 
The publication of this book led to a substantial academic conference on our campus in 2005 on the topic of teaching peace, attended by over 200 teachers and scholars, primarily from colleges and universities associated with the historic peace churches, Quakers, Brethren, Mennonites. However, the most exciting and gratifying outcomes of the scholarship represented by this book involved the transformation of classroom practices and student experience. Every faculty member at Bluffton will have their own story to tell, but in my communication classes, this collaborative project has dramatically changed the way I teach such classes as public speaking, leadership communication, argumentation and advocacy, and communication ethics. Oriented as I had been by the traditional arts of rhetoric, my practice had been to teach speech and advocacy as a kind of discursive and strategic combat. Determine your purpose, scope out the audience's vulnerabilities, and exploit their emotional and prejudicial weaknesses in order to achieve your goals. <laughs> it's a little hyperbolic, but... <laughs> From this perspective, research is essentially gathering of ammunition, arrangement is loading your rhetorical weapons, and delivery unleashes your payload on the audience. Now, on good days at least, my students are invited to consider public communication as a practice of peaceable persuasion, an opportunity to offer and receive gifts of knowledge, insight, and order. Rather than achieve victory over an audience, my students are encouraged to serve them. By considering prophetic and apostolic models of speech found in the Bible, students are able to understand that both bad news and good news are features of the kind of truth-telling that will serve their audiences well and enable thoroughly informed and less easily corruptible decisions. Moreover, by entertaining the rejection, the possible rejection of the offered message, public speech is empowered to speak the more humble, the more particular, and the more human truth that makes us free. This truth is often better served by the weaker argument than by the stronger one. This truth cannot be imposed either through demanded assent or manipulative appeal. This truth can only be offered in the manner of Jeremiah and Isaiah and Jesus Christ, through submission to rather than domination over the audience. So whether they are advocating for a public policy, opposing a leadership decision, providing instruction, describing a software function, marketing a product, or preaching the gospel, my students are learning that the dearest and most life-changing knowledge can only ever be offered as a gift. So in my public speaking classroom and in many other learning contexts across our campus, Bluffton faculty and students are learning that the way to peace is the way of peace. This can only be true, we are also realizing, if peace is the will of God, if peace is already built into the universe's grain. And so, teaching peace at Bluffton turns out to be, just as it was for Menno Simons, a matter of faith, a matter of which prince is being served, the prince of peace or the prince of strife. Thanks. All right. Good morning, everybody. This is, uh, I have to make sure I got my. Um, now for something completely different. <laughs> I was going to say that actually, um, but there are some really interesting similarities that may or may not come out in my discussion. That is, th the notion of pervasive moral formation that you clearly got from Gerald is really replicated in many ways at the Naval Academy. Uh, I'm gonna, my focus will be a much narrower on a particular course that we d that we deliver, but you know if you go to the Naval Academy, I think I've been a, le a little outflanked by Gerald. I could have brought pictures <laughs> of cannons and videotapes of bombs dropping, and I intend to drop a nuclear payload on you all, and not th my, not by argument, but um, so anyway, there are interesting similarities and differences. Let me. Uh, my task is to reflect on how we teach the morality of war and peace at the United States Naval Academy. Uh, I will focus on, academ ac on academic instruction regarding the morality of war, and more particularly the ethics course that I have taught for the past decade or so. As I understand it, my task is primarily descriptive and analytical to articulate how we teach the ethics of war and not necessarily to show that we do it better than anybody else. Of course, I'm happy to talk about normative matters in the conversation that follows. So let me begin with three quick points. First, I don't speak in any official capacity. <laughs> my assessments are my own, not the academies, much less the navies. Uh, they are, moreover, the assessments of a, a mere civilian, someone who has not a scintilla of military experience. So I speak to you as one without authority. <laughs> Second, the Naval Academy is a kind of national seminary 
one that prepares not priests or pastors, but military officers. And very, very broadly speaking, the primary wartime function of an officer is not to fight, but to lead others who fight. But leading subordinates uh, in war is only one of an officer's potential responsibilities. Consequently, the Naval Academy cannot sensibly prepare midshipmen, and I gather you know students at the Academy are called midshipmen or mids. Uh, they can't sensibly prepare mids only for leadership in war. Rather, its formative aims are broader, roughly, to inculcate skills, sensibilities, and virtues that enable mids to lead others in war and peace. My discussion reflects that reality, and so some of what I have to say focuses on moral instruction about officership and leadership, broadly construed, rather than about war. In the end, though, I believe these cannot be separated. Third and finally, MIDs learn all kinds of things about the morality of war outside of formal academic settings. And what they learn outside of class can be every bit as formative as what they learn inside. It's one thing to learn that St. Augustine condemns cruelty in war, and quite another for a revered company officer to do so. The latter will often make a more powerful and lasting impression than the former. Of course, if it turns out that her company officer lusts after cruelty, then it is, so far forth, less likely that her reading of Augustine will stay with her. In short, academic instruction has its role to play, but only as one element of a much broader formative process. And I wanted to talk more about that, but I'm not able to do that. So hopefully we can talk about that in the conversation. I will return to that briefly at the end. So with these broad points in mind, let me turn to some specific curricular nuts and bolts. Prior to the beginning of her junior year at the Naval Academy, each midshipman must complete moral reasoning for naval leaders, a semester-long course of instruction that affords mids a sustained opportunity to reflect on the moral duties of military officers and the temptations to which the inhabitants of that social role are characteristically beset. Each iteration of that course is delivered by a team of instructors composed of one civilian academic and three to five military officers. Each team abides by a rough and ready division of labor. Basically, the civilian is responsible for the philosophical content of the course. Every Monday for 15 weeks, each civilian professor lectures to about 80 mids on some canonical, philosophical, or theological text. Every, after every philosophy lecture, small groups of midshipmen meet twice weekly with experienced officers to reflect on how the theoretical material addressed earlier in the week bears on some particularized scenario. In short, moral reasoning for naval leaders attempts to meld moral theorizing and practical wisdom by means of close pedagogical cooperation between philosophers and officers. As you can imagine, this cooperative effort can be quite difficult, even fractious. Uh, uh, I have to say, Shannon French is in the front row. Shannon and I taught at the Naval Academy for years, and we've had plenty of stories to tell about relationships between officers and philosophers. So, for example, military officers are sometimes frustrated by the abstractness of philosophical conceptions that purportedly bear on realities they have experienced at first hand. And civilians can be impatient with, even dismiss, the anecdotal sea stories by, which, by means of which officers often intend to convey moral wisdom. So in our little course, in our relationship with the officers, we have a little bit of the experience that Professor Walser was talking about yesterday between theoreticians and practitioners. And, uh, the relations can be interesting. I had one story I said I wasn't going to tell, but I guess I will say it. Well, you're going to have to tell me when I'm going over my time. My first military boss, Corky Vasquez, gave me the best advice I got when I, was, when I first began teaching at the academy. He said, Everly, you're not a military officer. You, you never will be a military officer. Don't try to pretend you're a military officer. You are an egghead. I'm a military officer. You do your job. I'll do my job. And then we'll be able to teach the mids what they need to know. And I think, uh, I think he's basically right about that. And uh, you know, if you want to talk about why, I'm happy to, happy to talk about it. So a thorough discussion of such difficulties would take us far afield. Suffice to say, um, I think that the cooperative educative, educative effort between civilians and officers is best accomplished when both parties respect their vocational limitations. When this happens, the arranged marriage of abstract philosophy and concrete experience between civilian and military, theory and practice, provides MIDS with an opportunity to reflect, reflect critically on very, different, very difficult moral questions that they might one, one day have to answer in earnest. So let me turn now to the elements of moral reasoning for naval leaders for which I and my civilian colleagues 
are primarily responsible. It's philosophical content. For the most part, we cover material that you'll find in a standard introductory course in ethics in any public university. Readings from Plato's Republic, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, Aquinas' Summa, Kant's Groundwork, Rawls's Theory of Justice, Mills on Liberty, and so on. So the first two-thirds of the course wends its way through a familiar range of topics, relativism, utilitarianism, rat rational autonomy, human dignity, universalization, positive and negative liberty, and so on. The point throughout is to introduce MIDS to the various and sundry reasons that moral agents ought to take into consideration as they go about determining how they ought to act. Of course, we attempt to tailor these discussions to the particularities of their vocation. So, for example, we discuss utilitarianism by reflecting on a whole range of cases in which military professionals have to make very difficult trade-offs, whether to send a second helicopter out to rescue a first that has already gone down in a storm, whether to close a hatch on crew members in a submarine that would otherwise sink, and so on. The last third of moral reasoning for naval leaders directly addresses the morality of war. And here I take it that uh, institutional reality shaped the content of our curriculum. It, it, and it does so in a number of respects, and I'll mention three. Uh, first, given that the Naval Academy prepares MIDS to serve in an institution, one of the primary functions of which is, as they say, to break things and kill people, and given that this is common knowledge, most MIDS are strongly inclined to affirm the moral permissibility of the military use of violence in war. For better or worse, our students assume as a matter of course that wars can and do pass moral muster. Frankly, we do little to challenge that assumption, and our curriculum reflects that fast. We have no formal place for a robust discussion of pacifism, no readings from Hauerwas or Yoder or Holmes, nothing of the sort. Second, as you might expect, the vocational aims of the Naval Academy lead us to accord pride of place to the so-called just war tradition. The five weeks we spend on the morality of war are pervasively shaped by concepts, claims, and readings that lie well within the broad confines of that amorphous and disputatious tradition of thought. So for example, we begin by addressing ad bellum issues with familiar just war conceptions, just cause, legitimate authority, right intention, and by reflecting on familiar texts from Aquinas and Walzer, as well as less familiar work by David Roden and Jeff McMahon. Then we spend a number of weeks on in bellow issues, that's the primary focus, as you can imagine, for people who are going to be in the military and have to deploy a military force. So those that both those that arise in conventional military conflict between nation states as well as those that arise between nation states and various non-state actors. In recent years, we focused ever more narrowly on the latter, drone strikes against members of terrorist organizations, counterinsurgency, cyber war, and so on. I spent the last year on uh, sabbatical studying the ethics of cyber war and the Naval Academy is just putting together two required classes for MIDS have to, uh, MIDS have to take on, on cyber war and, and the, the use of computers to, it, to launch attacks of various sorts raises very difficult um, questions about the morality of war. Um, in some cases, unique questions. Uh, third, institutional realities also shape how we teach the just war tradition, how we understand its component complaint claims what we emphasize, and so on. To reflect with future officers on the morality of war is to reflect with young men and women who might very well be called to direct the military violence to which the just war tradition's various provisions most obviously apply. This vocational reality naturally shapes one's understanding of the tradition's uh, uh, point and purposes. As I see it, the moral point of the just war tradition, if it has one, is not to help its adherents resolve interesting theoretical quandaries or to provide them with a handy decision procedure to be employed when they happen to reflect on some particularly net nettlesome moral quandary. Rather, its primary purpose, or at least a main purpose, is to discipline the thoughts and the emotions of its adherents so that they are cognitively and emotionally equipped to wage war with justice. It's a way of thinking and conceiving of war that, one hopes, shapes the manner in which its adherents construe war and thereby the emotions they experience when they are caught up in violent communal conflict. War engages the emotions, and their emotions need to be morally disciplined if soldiers and marine, sailors and marines are to fight in ways that respect basic moral norms. Given this very broad understanding of the just war tradition, we accord what I take to be unusual importance to the so-called right intention requirement. Let me expand a bit on this point. In my judgment, um, many contemporary treatments of the tradition give short shrift to the claim that wars must be fought with right intention. When they do affirm this claim, many theorists understand it in a rather narrow manner. 
Simply put, warring parties must be motivated to, to fight by the reasons that make war permissible. So, for example, if the United States is to wage war in response to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, then, say, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait must constitute an, an egregious injustice. That injustice must actually provide a just cause for war. And the civilian authorities in the United States must be properly motivated by the egregious injustice to respond with military violence. But this is a rather crimped understanding of the right intention requirement. Consider, by contrast, Aquinas's paradigmatic exposition. So here, is, here he is from a, 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 a text I'm sure most of you are familiar with. It may happen that, even if war be declared by a legitimate authority and for a just cause, it is nonetheless rendered unlawful through a wicked intention. Hence, Augustine says, and he quotes Augustine to explicate that idea. The passion for, and this is a famous passage from Augustine, right? The passion for inflicting harm, the cruel thirst for vengeance, an unpacific and relentless spirit, the fever of revolt, the lust of power, and such like things, all these are rightly condemned in war. Aquinas here takes the right intention requirement to apply to a very wide range of internal states. Greed, cruelty, an unpacific spirit, the desire to do harm, the thirst for vengeance, the lust to dominate, all of these varied kinds of internal state manifest a lack of righteous intention. By privileging the right intention requirement and by following Aquinas in construing it to cover a whole range of internal subjective states, desires, attitudes, hopes, intentions, motives, and so on, we have the opportunity to reflect with MIDS on a wide diversity of questions of great importance to them, both as human beings and as future officers. So here's a list of the kinds of questions we, we address that fall into this rubric. Is it appropriate for me to experience joy upon the killing of enemies who are most assiduously trying to kill me and those with whom I have bonded? So joy that's occasioned by the death of enemy combat combatants, which is not the same as joy in the death of enemy combatants, is apparently a very common accompaniment of combat. There's a really nice book we were talking yesterday about literature to read. There's a really a wonderful book by Sebastian Junger. I'm sure most of you, many of you are familiar with it on uh, just called War. And it's his experience as uh, being sort of embedded with a group of people in Afghanistan. And, and he said to himself, and, and he went and visited with these folks, and, and he said, the one thing I wanted to explain in this book was why these men found this to be such an exhilarating, fulfilling experience. Um, so Professor Walser was talking yesterday about how difficult it is for soldiers and how, how coercive it is. But these folks that he was with found it to be the most fulfilling experience of their lives in many cases. And um, he said that there was a, uh, uh, and if you've seen the movie Restrepo, some of you have seen the movie Restrepo, you see how godforsaken the place, not literally, I don't mean that, but just what a difficult circumstance these, these folks were in. And so one of the guys comes back from, uh, from Afghanistan and somebody writes him a letter and says to one of the fellows who was in this unit that he had followed for the year and said, what do you miss about, what, about uh, your time there? And he said, his response was, everything. I miss everything about it. So one of the questions you have is, what do you do with your joy? People who fight, in many cases, love it. They find it the most meaningful experience in their lives. Another set of questions. May I cultivate in myself and my subordinates an attitude of professional detachment, one in which my enemies are construed, say, not as human beings with family members who love them, not as predatory animals devoid of moral standing, not as cancerous tumors, but as legitimate targets whose hostile acts the extent rules of engagement permit me to kill. Must I feel sadness or guilt or regret when I justly kill another human being? May I hate those who torture a captured comrade or pound nails into the legs of helpless children or who attack us with bombs affixed to handicapped noncombatants? Reflection on such questions naturally raises further and even deeper questions. What spiritual resources do I have to draw on should it turn out that I really am responsible for the death of a subordinate? How can I be forgiven for wrongs committed against human beings that I have killed? but who are not around to forgive me? How am I going to deal with my own impending death? I have to say that in my judgment, we do not excel in addressing questions of the latter sort, religious or spiritual questions, matters of guilt, forgiveness, and dread. It's a, it's a strange kind of seminary education, I have to say. We emphasize the importance of the virtues, 
of the high standards to which MIDs are accountable. That language is ubiquitous at the Naval Academy. Midshipmen are held to a higher standard. Military professionals are held to a higher standard. But we say very little about how they are, they are to respond to the moral failings that will inevitably afflict them. We wax eloquent, so you can, um, my background is Lutheran, right? We wax eloquent about the law, but we are mute about the gospel. Perhaps potted conceptions of the proper relation between church and state impede us from doing so. Perhaps those kinds of questions are too hard to answer, or at least they're too hard to answer without appealing to robust and controversial conceptions of the good that we cannot officially affirm at a national seminary or federal government institution. I should say that we spend a week discussing Stoicism, which I take to include, a, to be a kind of religious vision, and one that speaks very powerfully to many midshipmen. It provides an opportunity to reflect with them on death, uh, on an uncomfortable topic, but one that I have found most mids eager to discuss. But moral failure and how to respond to it, for the most part, we leave it to mids to figure it out on their own. Uh, there's a wonderful book, I don't know where you are, right, uh, by Carl Morlantes. And if you remember the first chapter on Carl Morlantes, uh, uh, what it's like to go to war, he says, but the first decision that I had to make when I was a comp uh, platoon commander, I believe, in, uh, in Vietnam, uh, ended up killing members of my unit or injuring members of my unit. And, you know, the first time I did something, I killed my own unit members. And he was incredibly guilty. I mean, war is full of guilt, moral failure. And, and uh, they're going to experience that, and we try to provide them with an opportunity to reflect on how they're going to deal with that. Let me make three final points about the role of the just war tradition in our curriculum. Despite our heavy reliance on the just war tradition, that conception of the morality of war enjoys a kind of unusual uh, normative standing. It functions as a kind of informal orthodoxy. What does that mean? As far as the Naval Academy is concerned, no particular formation and not even the, the uh, formulation and not even the tradition itself is the correct or preferred conception of the morality of war. Correlatively, a midshipman may, without prejudice, reject any and all formulations thereof. After all, affirmation of a philosophical conception of the morality of war, like the just war tradition, cannot be a requirement of officership any more than can an affirmation of utilitarianism or the divine command theory or any of the other philosophical theories to which we introduce our students. That said, most midshipmen and most of the military officers who helped to, del to deliver moral reasoning for naval leaders do in fact affirm some version of the just war tradition and typically assume that their students will as well. As I said, the just war tradition enjoys only a kind of informal orthodoxy, one that mids are encouraged but can hardly be required to inhabit. Second, the privileged place we accord to the just war tradition helps us to achieve one of our central moral aims. Here a bit of background will be helpful. Prior to the beginning of their junior year, mids may leave the academy at any time. They don't pay any tuition, I imagine you know. Your tax dollars pay for their tuition. Prior to the beginning of their junior year, uh, they may leave at any time for any reason and without any financial penalty or uh, military obligation. But at the beginning of their junior year, each must make a formal commitment to complete the final two years of their education and thereafter five years of active duty military service. Uh, plausibly, um, Plausibly, a midshipman can sincerely and in good conscience make her so-called two-for-seven commitment, two-for-seven, finish your last two years of the academy, uh, and uh, two, two years there, seven years after that. Only if she has some clear understanding of the duties that follow from her making that commitment. One of the most important goals of moral reasoning for naval leaders is to provide mids with the opportunity to wrestle with the normative implications of that commitment. And of course, the duties of officership can be quite onerous. One of the most onerous legal duties of a military officer is that each must comply with the determinations of the relevant civilian authorities to go to war. Moreover, the military officers I know invariably believe that they are also morally bound to exhibit the, that kind of deference. Each takes a solemn oath, their oath of commissioning, that is tacitly understood to generate a morally binding obligation to obey procedurally correct congressional and presidential mandates to go to war, irrespective of their evaluation of that war. That's what they promise to do as a condition of becoming an officer in the military. One of the main reasons why we discuss the ad bellum components of the just war tradition is to compel mids to reflect on whether they can take that oath sincerely and with a good conscience. 
we say, in effect, here are the preferred standards for assessing war, but you must realize that you will make a binding commitment that might very well require you to fight in a war that violates the very standards we taught, we taught to you and that we expect you to adhere to. I should note that we don't specify how they're supposed to decide, um, and there are some MIDs who decide that they can't make the commitment, and they leave the academy as a consequence of taking the class. It's not many. Some do. Uh, it bears on, I don't know how I'm doing with time. I imagine not, not well. Um, but this relates to, it's an interesting uh, um, data point with respect to Professor Walsh's discussion last night, right? Th my students, people in the United States military today, they are not subject to the kind of coercive regime that uh, soldiers, members of the military in, say, North Korea are, or Nazi Germany, right? All of my students volunteer, and they know what they're volunteering for. Uh, there's no coercion there. There's pressure, but I think that coercion is not the right word to describe midshipmen who have my class and know exactly what they're getting into. Not exactly. I shouldn't say exactly. <laughs> That's not right. That's not right. <laughs> Third and finally, although MIDs must take an oath that legally binds them to fight in even unjust wars, that oath does not oblige them to obey any and every legal order, um, every order directed at them by a duly authorized superior. For of course, a military professional is required not to obey illegal orders, and many legal orders are foolish or flatly immoral, or would be either foolish or immoral were the recipient to obey their most natural interpretation. And we discuss many such cases, some of which uh, arise in the context of war. And about such cases, we, have, we rely on, and I am happy to give you one example after another, of, but I'm sure you're familiar with plenty of stupid or immoral orders. About such cases, we rely on an understanding of civil disobedience inspired by Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. When an officer, very roughly, when an officer takes feasible measures to be released from a legal but egregiously immoral order, then she may disobey that order, so long as she does so in public and is willing to accept the consequences of her disobedience. We have plenty of opportunity to impress upon MIDS that disobedience of this sort normally happens only once in her career, at its termination. <laughs> disobedience is permissible, and it's laudable. It's consistent with her taking the oath of commissioning. She's not violating that promise, but it's potentially ruinous. So, uh, so far I have focused primarily on the philosophical content of moral reasoning for naval leaders, as I take it that this is most directly relevant to our discussion today. But I should note that the most distinctive and the most important features of that course have little to do with what we civilians teach. Rather, I judge that the degree to which moral reasoning for naval leaders achieves anything of moral significance is primarily a function of the contributions of the military officers who helped to deliver that class. So let me briefly conclude br by briefly discussing the role that they play in the class. Each semester, roughly 30 Navy and Marine officers, command commanders, captains, that is Navy captains, colonels, lieutenant colonels, occasionally an admiral, volunteer to help teach moral reasoning for naval leaders. They, they must have at least 20 years of experience in the military, and so they, typic and so they typically serve in positions of leadership across the yard. So the way in which moral reasoning for naval leaders is staffed manifests a pretty significant commitment of institutional resources. It's roughly the equivalent of having a university's deans, registrar, and vice presidents volunteer to take a leading role in delivering a course of moral, moral instruction that shapes each and every student on the campus. The participation of military officers serves a number of important purposes. I'll mention only three, but there are many more than that. Um, first, it helps to foster a common moral uh, language and culture. As I noted at the outset, the moral formation of midshipmen is best achieved when what they learn in class is reinforced throughout the academy. Given the military officers, officers, given that the military officers who help to deliver the class also work with the football team, they serve on the commandant and superintendent staff, they hold the positional equivalent of the dean of College of Arts and Sciences or the School of Engineering, they're well positioned to pursue the, the, the academy's robust formative aims across the yard. So for example, some of the officers who help to teach more reasoning from naval leaders also participate in a mentoring program for the captains of sports teams in which they are encouraged to understand their experience as a leader in sports as preparation for small unit leadership in the fleet. There are many, many, many programs like that. I don't mean to be too starry-eyed about that, 
uh, what I'm describing is an ideal of pervasive moral formation, but one that's only imperfectly achieved. Second, officers serve as mentors and, mo and models for young future officers on whom they can have a profoundly powerful moral and in formative impact. It's one thing for an ectomorphic academic to prate about the discriminant use of military violence, and quite another for a brawny marine colonel with decades of military experience to say the same thing. The former might be able to formulate the principle of discrimination with greater precision, but without nearly the credibility. It's one thing to talk about death, from a philosophy professor who's got three kids, and my main problem is getting my kid to school. And it's another thing entirely to, you know, to talk about death this week with a, with a veteran of combat experience whose son just died in Afghanistan um, last year. Um, so this simple fact uh, makes the robust participation of military officers absolutely crucial, a necessary causal condition of the achievement of the Naval Academy's formative aims. Third and finally, the participation of military officers powerfully shapes the content of the course. Most particularly, the steady stream of rotational officers, many of whom are recently returned from combat environments, provides an equally steady stream of realistic and, temp and contemporary case studies. As I noted above, moral reasoning for naval leaders is supposed to marry theory and practice, abstraction and application. The participation of these experienced officers ensures that MIDs have the opportunity to reflect on difficult, very difficult scenarios that they might very well face with conversation <laughs> partners who are well positioned to appreciate the prax practical complexities raised therein. And I don't have time to describe these, these that we have many of these kind of cases that we have accumulated over the years, much less to specify in detail how they implicate issues of general moral principle. So let me leave you with one important con and contentious example. So we're almost done. First, a bit of background. Many midshipmen are serious about their faith. They sincerely intend to live and act in ways that reflect their faith commitments, not only as midshipmen or citizens or human beings, but also as future officers. We can therefore hardly avoid reflecting with them on the role that their religious commitments properly play in the vocation for which they're being prepared. The following case study, whose central actor was for years an instructor in the course, provides an, an ideal opportunity to mit, for MIDs to reflect on the proper role of their religious convictions in their profession. So here's the scenario. An unmarried sailor is deployed on Diego Garcia, and a remote island in the Indian Ocean. She learns that she is pregnant, she wants to get an abortion, but she cannot return to the United States until her 20th week. Of course, she has access to military doctors, but they're forbidden by congressional mandate to perform abortions. There are no civilian doctors on the island, so she requests emergency leave to return to the United States. She doesn't have a right to emergency leave, nor does she satisfy the eligibility requirements for emergency leave. Nevertheless, military regulation accords to the commanding officer, the CO, a broad discretion as to how he exercises his authority to grant emergency leave. As it happens, the CO, the commanding officer, takes friendship to God, with God to preclude intentionally killing the innocent, and so the intentional killing of a fetal human being. Consequently, he denies her request. Of course, he recognizes that he lacks the authority to prohibit her from getting an abortion. Because she has a legally protected right to get an abortion, any such order would lack normative force. Rather, the CO takes himself to have no obligation to help her commit such a grave injustice. Given that he is under no such obligation, he takes the grave moral injustice she intends to commit as an acceptable reason to make a decision he indisputably has the authority to make, that is to grant or deny emergency leave. There's a lot to say about that case. Um, uh, but they've told me that I should raise questions and not give answers. <laughs> so I'm happy to do that and just leave you with one of the questions that we ask the MIDS to think about. Uh, and for you as well. I mean, whatever your position on abortion, that's irrelevant, right? That's not, that's not an issue here, right? Whatever your position on abortion, do we want officers in, in the United States military to bracket their religiously grounded convictions regarding the moral status of vulnerable human beings, whether as an experienced CO on a, a military base in the Indian Ocean or as a young lieutenant commanding his first platoon in, Fallu in Fallujah? Uh, I think I'll end with that. Thank you very much. <laughs>